Okay, I think uh, it's a good time to start. Uh, welcome all to this uh, online course on using non-volatile memory, I call persistent memory programming. And my name is Adrian Jackson uh, from EPCC, and I'm going to be presenting the course today. Uh, my colleague Claire is also um, in this uh, course to help out as well with, uh, with uh, the practical side of presenting the course online, which is very useful. Uh, so I should say up front, the, the plan is, of course, there'll be some lectures um, and some practical sessions as well. Uh, so I'm going to uh, give you a, a couple of lectures between now and three o'clock, and then we'll have a break at three. Uh, and then I'll send you the details uh, personally uh, over email about how we do the practical sessions um, after that. I, I should also say I'm very happy to take questions. So if you want to shout questions at me, that's fine. Um, there is also a um, chat feature for this um, uh, online tool, which you can put stuff in. I'll, I'll keep an eye on that. Um, and actually, also for the course, we have um, a web page with a, a separate chat on it as well. So, so um, there is a web page there, uh, which has. Um, all the lectures I'm going to give today are linked off it. So if you if you go to visit that web page and scroll down, there's introduction, hardware, I/O, and storage, low-level persistent memory programming, and persistent thinking. Um, and shortly there'll be an exercise sheet showing up there too as well. So uh, it's a useful web page to have. It's off the Archer um, website. Um, okay. So the idea of this course is is to is to introduce the background of this of new memory technology which is starting to appear in in systems and starting to appear in HPC systems or machine learning systems um, both from a sort of theoretical standpoint so you know what is the hardware um, how do you use it but also from a practical standpoint so uh, we have a system here in Edinburgh uh, which has some of this memory in it uh, and the idea is that we'll talk about it, we'll talk about how you program it, and then we'll give you a chance to get on the system and uh, write some little programs and run them, or take some applications and run them on the persistent memory. So you can see how that's done, and also get a, a feel for performance uh, of, of the persistent memory as well. Um, and in reality, we're also interested in the wider sort of design questions as well. Uh, so not just what is the hardware and what is the programming API of the interface to use that hardware, but trying to get you to think a little bit about, okay, what functionality does this hardware offer me and how, how would I have to change my applications to use it or what kind of applications would benefit from using it? Uh, because one of the tricky things about this non-volatile memory is it, it's, it, it's mixed in two different kinds of um, functionality which generally have been separate for um, computer programs um, until recently that is you know volatile access to data for inside your program and non-volatile storage of data long term so it's mixing memory and it's mixing storage uh, and that can be a great thing but you need to understand what that means from a functionality point of view Otherwise, you may end up in scenarios where you thought the data sh was going to be saved because you're using this memory and it hasn't, and you lose data. Or uh, the other scenario, you think the data is volatile, so it doesn't matter if you mess it up because you can just go back and get a clean copy later from storage. But actually, you, it, you're uh, ending up working with your clean copy and you end up corrupting your data. And so as well as sort of understanding what the hardware is, and how you program it, uh, we also want to be able to understand some of the sort of a higher level design concepts of where it would fit into programs, what you have to be careful about, and what you have to focus on to make sure your programs still have performance and still are correct uh, long term. And some of this may be, the, you know, some of the great benefits of this kind of memory may be in actually redesigning how programs work, moving from models where I.O. has been very uh, monolithic, 
where you open up a file, you read all the data in, and you close the file, and then you work on the data in volatile memory to move your application to something like open the file up, take a small amount of data out, close the file, uh, do work on that, then go back to the file, and and uh, so on and so on. So there may be scope to do things like that, but it's just worth understanding what the performance for non-volatile memory is. Uh, and what the functionality is and, and where you have to put the functionality in your programs. The uh, um, lectures and practice, as I say, I'll, I'll talk some and then, um, then we'll get hands on. Uh, as well as on the Archer website, we have a GitHub page for most of this material as well. Uh, the material has been slightly changed for the online course. So it's, it's not exactly the same as this GitHub. Uh, repository but it's very similar uh, and so that's where uh, you can go and have a look at this uh, as well if you want um, and we're doing exercises on this remote machine we have in Edinburgh so this, this machine called uh, the next gen IO prototype because it was built in a, a European project called next gen IO uh, and that system has 34 nodes in it each node has three terabytes of Intel um, persistent memory, Intel non-volatile memory, uh, and we'll have a look at how we can use that over today uh, and next week. Uh, but don't worry, I have guest accounts set up for that. I haven't given them out yet. I wanted to, you know, give my first lecture, go into a break and then hand out the accounts to you uh, rather than giving them out in advance. Uh, we have a, a draft timetable for today and for next week. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, before three o'clock today here, or four o'clock if you're in Europe, uh, what I'm wanting to do is get through the basic uh, understanding of what the hardware is um, and where it fits inside systems. Then we'll have a break and there'll be a chance to play around on, on our system and, and not do any programming, but take some applications and run them. And then we'll come back and we'll actually look at some of the lower level programming APIs and and some of the design decisions you may you know, want to be aware of or you may have to be aware of when using this hardware. And then between now and next week, there'll be a couple of practicals you can do in your own time on the system um, if, you, if you want to take in the low level programming APIs and playing around with them a little bit. And then next week, uh, we'll look more at some of the higher level ways of programming this. So, some of the libraries and the functions and the tools that have been built by other people, which may be a more sensible way of using this hardware than, than directly programming it yourself, depending on what your application requirements are. So between now and next week, you'll also have access to a system to do the practicals. You'll have these guest accounts for a week. And beyond that, we'll then shut the guest accounts and it may be worth copying data off if you want to keep that long term, but, but I'll remind you about that again next week. Um, I should say at this point, this uh, online course has been organised and supported by Prace, which, uh, if you're not aware, is, is, a, is a European network for uh, high performance computing, and, and EPCC is a um, Prace advanced training centre. Uh, so Prace covers uh, uh, European countries and, and in re the majority of what Prace does is enable access to high performance computers and some very large uh, computers uh, around Europe but it also has these uh, Prace training centres which enable training and uh, uh, professional development courses like these but, uh, and many of us um, so if you go, if you're interested in, in more of these, I, I'm sure you're aware of this because you're on the course today. But the, the, there's a lot of these different courses um, listed on on the website, uh, and there's you know more more coming out uh, every week, every month. Um, so if you're interested in more of this kind of training, and such as you know, we've got a we've got a online OpenMP course and an online MPI course and there's, there's all sorts of those kind of things going on through Prace and through EPCC. Just have a look at the, the website. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, the interesting thing about what I call programming persistent memory or programming non-volatile memory if you want, uh, in reality there's, there's no difference between calling it persistent memory 
there's no real difference between persistent memory and non-volatile memory. It means the same thing. It just means memory which um, retains data after power has been switched off for a long enough time to consider it permanent. Uh, it may not actually retain the data forever. It may be 10 years, but it's long enough for computer programs where you consider once you've put the data on there, um, it's not going to change uh, until you come back and, and turn the system back on. In reality, the interesting thing to me about programming this, this new set of non-volatile persistent memory, which uh, is coming to market in the moment, this, this new perform more performance, more high performance memory, is actually it's quite easy. The actual programming of it is uh, a piece of cake or, or a whole cake, as I've got here. Uh, and in fact, um, if you're a C programmer or close to being a C programmer, um, you know, these set of uh, code lines I have on the screen are really all you need to do to exploit uh, the current generation of uh, Intel's Optane persistent memory from a program. In fact, all you really need is the second line down, that pmap, pmem map file, um, and then the bottom line, pmem persist. And with those two functions, they let you allocate data on the persistent memory and they let you make sure your data has been stored there long term. And that, that is all you really need. But of course, it's not as simple as that. So, you know, it's all well and good trying to make a cake like I had on my previous slide, but actually there's a lot more complexity in there than the list of ingredients you need. Uh, making sure you put the cake, the, the ingredients in, in the right order at the right time uh, for your particular application is the complexity of persistent memory programming. So it's not just how you do it. It's just not just what the functions the calls are or what the bits of code are. It's, you know, where do you have to put your persistence regions and how do you structure them to make sure your data is correct, to make sure your data is safe, and to make sure your program has good performance. Because there's many different ways that I could structure this here. If I moved that pmem persist inside the for loop before it, then I would still get correct, correct functionality, but my code would go 100 times slower. Um, and if I didn't put the pmem persist in there, that code would also work. But if I had a power failure or if I had some other thing that went wrong, I could end up with my um, A array here, the array um, containing my data I'm updating being in an inconsistent state. And that's just on a very small, you know, some of you may, may recognize the code here, actually, it's just a streams benchmark. Uh, but that's on a very small code where I choose to put my persistence functionality uh, and how often I do it will impact performance and correctness guarantees going forward. And for different programs, people have different requirements. So for some programs, actually, maybe you don't care whether the data is persistent or not. You just want to be able to use this large memory systems. You want to be able to use this very large memory space for certain data sets so you don't have to care about the persistent functionality and for other programs you may really care that your data is in a consistent state over time so that anything happens anything goes wrong you can come back to it and restart and it is correct and your data is guaranteed to correct so that that's the sort of complexity around it and that's the other reason why uh, we have different ways we can use this. So I'm not just teaching and discussing the low level APIs, but, but we're also looking at some of the more higher level functionality because the higher level functionality gives you some of these correctness guarantees built in and you don't have to write them yourself, but it may not be quite as performant or may not give you the functionality need for your application. So those are the kind of trade-offs you need to, to consider. The other reason why it's also not a piece of cake um, at least when you first start out with persistent memory, is there is actually many different ways we can use this current generation of uh, of memory. Intel um, have produced this Optane memory, 
but you can set it up and configure it and use it in different ways. You can set it up as a large memory space, but it's volatile. You can set it up as you know, not a memory space, but a, a disk. You can also set it up as a non-volatile large memory space. Um, and there are in each one of those different ways of configuration, configurating it and using it have different functionality, different performance and different correctness requirements. So this flow chart here is trying to capture some of those differences um, to LM and app direct mode over different ways you can configure the memory and hardware. And then once you've got that set up, you can use it as files or you can use it as memory or you can use and you and then inside your application, you can use it to optimize IO or to share data or to um, reduce your DRAM requirements or there's, there's many different ways we can do it. So that's why it's it's uh, useful to be able to have a little bit of an overview of this stuff and then think, you know, where in my applications could I use this and, and where would it benefit me and what, what, what is the performance and what does it look like? So the actual functionality I think is quite easy. Um, Programming the memory is quite easy, but it's the design and the performance and the correctness considerations of a challenge. And it's also de designing for persistence so that any data you're putting on this memory will actually stay there long term uh, and making sure that's you know, correct for your program uh, and correct functionality. Um, and understanding, you know, are we using this to protect against failures, against hardware failures, against power failures, or are we using this for large memory space or optimal I/O stuff? Um, so you, we, you, there's functionality considerations for where you would put this in your application, there's performance configuration, and then there's, of course, um, with any computer hardware, there are hardware configurations. Uh, but you can also consider as well, you know, do you set up this memory as, as being uh, an inside NUMA regions or striped across NUMA regions or, uh, with a single namespace or multiple namespaces, what kind of file systems you put on top of them, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I won't go through too much of the, the last point, the sort of hardware configurations, the more sysadmin side of this. Uh, if you're interested in that, drop me a, drop me a message, um, send me an email or or a message because um, you know we have a lot of experience of configuring this stuff, but it's it's not generally uh, as interesting to application developers as it is to sysadmins. So that's it's not really the focus of, of what we're looking at here. So uh, yeah, we're we, we are looking to uh, introduce the hardware in the next lecture, and then we'll go on to practicals. As I said at the, the beginning, um, please do ask questions because uh, there'll, there'll be lots of times where I don't explain what we're looking at very well. Uh, and it's useful if you can just tell me that and, uh, and I can go back and give a, you know, a respin of it and that, and that may, may help. Um, so whilst I switch over my PowerPoint between the introduction and the hardware and software stuff uh, has anybody got any questions um, at the moment or you know if i'm speaking too fast or you can't hear me let me know as well Okay, I'll just start off sharing the next um, PowerPoint then. And we'll talk about the hardware and the software. Uh, good question. So uh, the question is, is will Archer 2 have uh, uh, this kind of non-volatile uh, memory? Um, nope, no it won't. Um, and the, the simple reason for uh, Archer 2, which which if you're not a UK based person, you may not know what Archer is. So Archer is, is one of our UK national HPC services. 
Um, the current service is the Big Cray uh, XC30, and that's finishing next month. And we've got a new Cray coming in in April, I think, um, and that's replacing it. Uh, but the reason we're not, well, one of the main reasons we're not having non-volatile memory in Archer 2 is that non-volatile memory at the moment is an Intel product. So it's only Intel and their, their opt-in uh, that are there. Um, and of course, uh, the UK have decided to buy a big crew of AMD processors for Archer 2 for, you know, for uh, very good reasons. The AMD processors um, are very high performance, low cost, what we have, but they just can't use this uh, non-volatile memory, unfortunately, because uh, it's um, only the Intel processors which, which will enable it. Uh, and that's because, as we'll come on to see, um, it's not just normal memory, this you can plug into any system. Uh, because of the differences between it and normal DRAM, the memory controller, which is inside the processor, needs to understand what the memory is, um, which I'll say a little bit more about in, in, in this lecture. But because of that, it, you can't just plug it into any system. It has to be plugged into a system with certain Intel processors. And Intel being Intel, you know, you can't just take any of their processors with a certain line of large memory processors that you have to buy to use this hardware at the moment because they're the only ones that have the uh, memory controllers which have been designed to talk to this memory um, and to do to exploit this memory so unfortunately no actually two will not have this non-volatile memory some of the big us uh, next generation systems aurora i think and um, possibly uh, one of the other ones which are coming out uh, not this year but probably next year will have uh, but not um, not Archer 2. Any other questions? Oh, okay. So, just to take a slight step back, um, persistent memory. One of the places it can fill in the, in the system is is to provide optimized I/O functionality. So optimized data storage, uh, data reading in, and data writing out, uh, and that's because it's persistent. So you put your data on there, and it will stay there, and that's what you need for a, an I/O system. Um, so that's one of the places where it can provide very high benefits. And in fact, you know, we see using this hardware compared to something like Archer's Luster file system, you can go 100, um, 100 times faster easily, sometimes 1,000 times faster. Um, it, it's not the only place you necessarily want to use this or have to use this, but that's one of the things you can function, one of the functions you can use this non-volatile memory for. Um, but it's also, so it's, you know, it's um, always worth remembering that, you know, IO has always been hard on these systems. So IO, anything that optimizes high IO can be very beneficial for a certain set of applications. Um, and IO is often hard mainly because a lot of program, you know, optimization and benchmarking sort of ignore it. You know, I, I do it as well. If I'm taking a parallel application and, and looking at performance, quite often you ignore the IO stuff because it only happens at the beginning of the end or because it's not the majority of the run of the run time. Um, but for us, you know, one of the nice things about this new non-volatile memory is it, it, it has the potential to provide very high IO performance. And that may not be important for some applications, or certainly it may not be important for applications when you're not using very large numbers of cores or very big data sets. Um, but actually we once you start scaling up to tens of thousands of cores, hundreds of thousands of cores, um, this is where we start to see uh, I/O becoming a significant bottleneck for a lot, a bottleneck for a lot of applications. And certainly, we're also seeing new sets of applications coming through now: machine learning field, the bioinformatics field, where they they're much more uh, focused on I/O, or they have much uh, larger I/O requirements. And so this hardware is, it, you know, one of the places it looks like it can fit very nicely is in, is in optimizing that um, I/O stuff. Um, but I/O, of course, is is always hard. 
um, because it moves beyond this pr process and memory model um, and the data that you're working on your program actually has to sort of appear on a persistent physical device somewhere. But another another reason why I.O. is often hard as well is because the devices we traditionally use for I.O. Um, have, have no concept in them about program structure, data structures, these kind of things. So effectively, you just got a flat array or a flat file to store your data in, um, uh, and you have to map between your data structures in your program and your data structures in uh, and, uh, and this flat file. Now, you know, of course, there, there are ways around this. People uh, have built file formats to try and address kind of these things like the NetCDF HDF5 file formats, add in metadata, add in um, other functionality like that. But in reality, they're still storing data in a flat file. It's just that the programs that read and write that data have some understanding of, of how to reconstruct it from the flat file into your 1D, your 2D, your 3D arrays in your program. Um, and of course, the other you know challenging thing about um, I/O has been performance for devices. So actually, in reality, you know some of the newest non-volatile memory um, devices designed to um, plug into your uh, directly into your computer, so the PCIe devices, NVMe devices, now can get really quite quite high performance, um, but they're still providing a um, Hardware where you have a flat file, you have a flat uh, storage device which, with no concept of, of program data structures, um, and you have a device which is separate from the processor and the memory. It's something that's plugged in across a device bus like PCI Express or across a network somewhere else. So all of these uh, factors mean that I/O or data storage and and uh, retrieval has, has uh, been problematic in terms of performance and functionality for applications for, for a long time. Uh, now, of course, um, this is doubly true for parallel programming as well. So when, when we have um, the issues we have with storage to standard um, IO devices, we also run into further issues when we look at parallel programs because file systems and files are not traditionally set up to deal with uh, multiple processes accessing the same file and the same data at the same time. Um, underlying what's going on with a file system and with files um, is the whole operating system to device uh, barrier or operating to system to device uh, interface where the operating system works on blocks of data which are stored in a file. So traditionally something like a four kilobyte, 4,000 byte uh, chunk of data is the minimum thing that an operating system will work on. So if you want to read and write a single value from a file, the operating system, because it's talking to an external device like a network where your file system is attached to, or like a um, disk drive or a, a SSD or an NVMe plugged into your computer, it goes away and it talks to it for you. So your, your program talks to the operating system. There's a there's a, a OS fault. Um, the operating system then goes and talks to the device and, and, and pulls the data back or, or copies the data to the device as required. And that's done on, a, on chunks, 4K blocks, maybe two megabyte blocks, depends on, on what your file system is, is set up to do. Uh, and of course, that has issues from both a performance point of view, i.e. if you are doing a sparse uh, data um, update and reading uh, task where you take one element of a file and then you move it on and, and you take another element of a file and you move on somewhere else and take another element of a file. Well, each of those reads or writes uh, is going to be triggering a, a large block of data to be moved backwards and forwards from the device. It's going to be triggering that 4K 
blocked and he moves backwards and forwards. And that's problematic from a performance point of view because you're moving much more data than you actually need to. Um, and because those the I/O is done in those block those block levels, there's no coherency for parallel um, programming. Um, so for multiple processes to access the file or the data um, at the same time. So there are, of course, um, bits of uh, software or hardware which fix this problem for us. So Lustre, GPFS, these kind of file systems, parallel file systems, um, address this problem for us by enabling programs to access the same file at the same time and also by splitting up um, files across multiple bits of hardware, a bit like this picture here, which is an abstract representation of our file system on Archer, which is a Lustre file system, where all our computer nodes, all our compute nodes are connected together by a network, and then the same network also connects them to a file system which is a separate file system thing sitting with its own hardware, its own servers. Each one of those servers has a bunch of disks in them. Um, and then your files are split up and, and um, striped across those so that in parallel you can access different bits of a file from different processes at the same time. So, you know, I.O. is hard. Uh, I.O. hardware has traditionally been this asynchronous external device which has both performance impacts and it has impacts on, on how you access data efficiently. Uh, accessing data in these chunks of 4K has meant that to get good performance for I.O. You, you want to be able to do in contiguous I.O. Um, and also you know, the coherency and the data structures that the I.O. systems are um considering or no providing generally don't map very well to your applications so your application your application you may have a 3d array with some linked lists sitting off it um, but if you want to store that to a disk you need some way of copying that down into bytes putting that onto a file and then reconstructing it when you read it back in again um, the nice thing about um the non-volatile memory that we're talking about here, and we'll be playing around with in a little bit, um, is that it addresses some of these problems. So no, non-volatile memory is not a new thing. And you know, in fact, you all have lots of non-volatile memory sitting around in your consumer electronics devices, or, or, or I certainly do. My phone has a, you know, a little micro SD card in it, which is non-volatile memory. My camera's got a, a bigger micro SD card in it. Um, you know, as I said before, not all non-volatile in this concept means, in this context means, is it will store your data without power for a considerable um, length of time. The challenge up till now with non-volatile has been that uh, it generally has been far slower than volatile memory. So volatile memory, I would mean uh, DRAM or SDRAM or something like that, where you have uh, electrically stored data, where the, the data has been stored in a capacitor or in some kind of uh, set of transistors. Um, so traditionally, non-volatile memory has been much slower than that, you know, two or three orders of magnitude, 100,000 times slower than that, and also less durable. Um, so non-volatile memory traditionally uh, hasn't doesn't stand up to very large numbers of reads and writes of the same uh, cells of the same places where the data has been stored. Uh, over time, they degrade and and fail, uh, and so your memory wears out. And in fact, if you buy an SSD today, stick it in your computer, that SSD will actually have more storage in it generally than, you, than you're buying. You buy a 256 gigabyte one, it may have 320 gigabytes of storage in there. And that's so that over time, the bits that fail can be replaced by the bits that are not being used currently. Um, so your life, your device has a reasonable lifetime. 
Um, so those are sort of the reasons why it's not been a prominent technology in the kind of um, computing work that we, you know, in the kind of computers we use for computational simulation and for machine learning and those kind of. But it's not to say that people haven't been looking at this kind of technology to provide benefits for uh, high perform well, for, for, for servers and, and desktop computers and high performance computers. And that's really because the whilst up till now this non-volatile memory has been you know slower and and less uh, durable than uh, volatile memory, it has the benefit of being very dense. So you can get, you know, 32 gigabytes or 64 gigabytes in a very small area compared to what you would need to tip for that uh, area to be a volatile memory, to be DRAM or something like that. And that's just because of the energy uh, and heat, heat, you know, energy requirements and heat generation of, of volatile memory using large numbers of transistors or capacitors um, and, and something to do, you know, so... Uh, so that has meant that it, is, it has been attractive in some ways for from computing, and because and also because it stores data long term because it's, vol, it's non volatile, it's also been seen as a, a very interesting technology for ma maintaining uh, your data in in, in uh, the event of power loss and these kind of things. So people have been working on non volatile memory for a while, and indeed. Uh, the people who you know, the, the standards organization body of uh, JDEC who do the you know the standardization for things like uh, RAM you know the DDR and um, uh, DIM standards uh, I have a bunch of standards for non-volatile memory NVDIM standards um, and uh, up till recently these have sort of fallen into these three different categories NVDIM-F NVDIM-N and NVDIM-P. So um, NVDIM-F is effectively just the kind of non-volatile memory you get in your uh, micro SD card or in your phone um, for, for storage, put into a, a, a DIM a format and plugged into your computer. Um, uh, of course, that's very slow memory because that kind of memory is, is Hundred times, thousand times slower than DRAM. So, for anything that requires performance, it's, it's not really of interest. NVDIM N uh, on the same DIMs it has some flash memory of the same size as a backup and then when the dims themselves um when the dims themselves experience a power failure they have some supercapacitors attached to them which means that they copy all the data off um into that flash memory before their power runs out and then when you come back and restore power they can boot back up copy the data back into the dram and keep going as if nothing had happened. So this is sort of a, a um, uh, an approach not to give you more memory and not to give you faster performance or different functionality, but just to make sure that you you can run a, for instance, a database in memory and cope with any power failures without losing any data. And then there's this idea of ND, NVDIM-P, and this is here what the kind of memory we're going to be talking about and using today and next week is this op Intel Optane memory, op what, what Intel call Optane DC PMM, DC persist data center persistent memory, um, is something like this NVDIM P, although technically it isn't actually an NVDIM P. And it's the idea that you have um, non volatile memory which has much higher performance and much lo longer lasting. Um, durability sitting alongside DRAM in the same memory channels. Um, good. So this is what it, it looks like. Um, the picture here in the middle is, is two DIMMs, two of these Intel opt-in DIMMs uh, mirrored. 
but it just looks like standard memory which you plug into a um, memory controller on a motherboard sorry you plug into a motherboard on a standard pc so it has the same connectors it looks very similar to standard memory it has a bunch of chips on it um, and you can plug it in and use it as if it was normal memory because of the way it's configured now in reality um, the reason it's 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 useful well the reason it can be used is that Intel and Micron have come up with a new uh, type of memory a new material uh, this 3d cross point memory which is what they call a phase change memory um, and this is a picture of it here on the left hand side these green and yellow stacked up things this is a phase change technology and it, it's a way of storing data in inside a, inside a material by charging it up with electrical current but then once you've charged it up the data stays there and you can read it out without having to recharge it by just changing the material properties so it's a layering up of a bunch of different materials which lets you read the ones and zeros out of it non-destructively and lets you update the ones and zeros in it um, and to store it over time um, and so that means that we actually have memory here which we can plug into the normal memory uh, channels on our processor on our motherboard in our computers we can read and write data from it but when we're not using it we don't have to put any energy into it because it still it, it keeps the data uh, long term without any energy without any power um, and it can give us very large capacity compared to normal memory because it's this special material which doesn't require transistors in it to to or capacitors in it to, to store the data because it stores it non-volatilely uh, we can get very high capacity so uh, these kind of uh, intel optane dc uh, pmm dims uh, at the moment they sell them in 128 gigabytes 256 gigabytes and 512 gigabyte dims you can put 12 of these uh, you can actually put more but say you can put 12 of these into each server means you can if you are willing to buy the expensive parts and, and, and put enough in there put six terabytes of memory inside a, a system where we can where you can store and, and manipulate data through the processor um, and so that's you know where we're the, the, the nice thing about this of course it's, is that it's non-volatile but also very large storage uh, and has reasonable performance now of course it doesn't have the same performance as, as DRAM as normal memory so it's not as fast as normal memory um, and interestingly enough it has also got different performance when you're reading it compared to when you're writing it because reading it is generally um, quick or quicker than writing it because when you're writing it you have to do this phase change you have to make material change uh, what it's currently got stored there whereas when you're reading it you just sense in what that material is currently stored as and, and pull it out so so we have this memory it's very high capacity it's, it's very high endurance so the, the other uh, um, property which makes it useful is it's got much higher endurance than normal flash memory normal non-volatile memory so we should be able to put it in your computer and use it for I can't remember what Intel say now but say 10 years worth of ordinary operation uh, without uh, running into um, durability problems something like that seven years ten years it's long enough that it should outlive the computer um, but it is slightly slower than memory and it's slower to read to write than it is to read uh, now of course this is why you can't plug this memory into every computer because because reading and writing to that memory is slower than reading and writing to volatile memory and you have non-volatile and volatile memory, memory plugged into the same processor you need the processor to have a memory controller that understands that and it doesn't wait when it's when it's talking to the non-volatile memory it doesn't block the memory traffic to the to the volatile to the normal DRAM um, uh, dims because if it did that then you'd slow the whole computer down uh, there are also other things that are built into this um, non-volatile memory dim um, because it's a persistent memory 
Um, there's a bunch. Of, there's a microcontroller built in there as well, which will do a bunch of other things for you. Uh, primarily encryption, uh, but also error checking, um, so that you can be sure that your data is encrypted on the DIM. So if someone came along, pulled that DIM out of a computer and, and took it and put, plugged it into another one, they wouldn't be able to get your data because it's been encrypted on the device. Um, and, and they would need the, encrypt, uh, the de-encryption key to uh, to be able to read it. Um, in a similar way that you probably want to encrypt your SSDs inside your computer. So if someone came along and stole one of your SSDs, they wouldn't be able to get access to the data. So now what we're teaching, uh, what we're talking about uh, today and next week, and, and the programming um, APIs and all those kind of things are in are general. You know, so the, the programming APIs are designed to enable you to program any kind of persistent memory. Uh, it just turns out that this is the only kind of persistent memory that with these kind of performance characteristics you can buy at the moment. So Intel's Optane DCPMM used to be called 3D crosspoint memory. But Intel's Optane DCPMM is really the only one that is on the market and you can buy. Uh, now, if people come along in the future, which you know there are people working on other kinds of persistent memory um, and deliver those, um, and there's competition for Intel's DCPMM, uh, Optane stuff, uh, then the stuff we're talking about is sh should also be relevant for their uh, hardware as well. So the ways you program it, the design considerations, performance considerations should also be, um, uh, should also map around to other technologies as well. But yes, it's non-volatile memory. It's much larger capacity than DRAM. So you might normally have 16 gigabytes on a DRAM stick and here we'd have 128. 256 gigabytes, so it's it's a sort of order of magnitude denser than normal memory, but it is slower than that memory, um, and it has this read-write asymmetry. So I, I overstated the endurance a little bit. Uh, I can see here I've put five-year warranty on them. So so Intel is saying that you you know you should be able to read and write them for five years without having uh, any wearing out of them, so which, which you know, given the lifetime of most computers, is probably fine for most people. Uh, so, the interesting question, of course, is um, I'll maybe skip ahead. Um, is how much slower or how much faster than um, than DRAM? Well, not, not how much faster. How much slower than DRAM is this memory? Because, of course, if it's 100 times slower than DRAM, then it might be interesting, but it's not going to be of use to most applications. Um, so from the measurements that we, we've done with our hardware, um, and of course, this is comparing to a specific DDR4 or DRAM, but the measurements we've done, reading data from this is about three times slower than DRAM, you know, for a certain type of read. So let's talk about streaming synchronous reads where you are accessing contiguous data. It's about three times slower than DRAM and writing it is about seven times slower than DRAM. So from your disk. So if you if you took if you if you wrote to your normal memory or you wrote to the opt-in DRAM it would take about seven times longer to write to the opt-in. Um, and there you can see the performance variability between the read and write on the Optane as well. It's about four times, five times faster to read this hardware we see that, than it is to uh, write to it. But of course, you know, compared to DRAM, to this volatile memory, that means it's slow. Uh, it's not terrible, but it's slow. Um, but it's much, much faster than other kinds of I.O. So, for instance, on our... Uh, on on uh, my the prototype system will get access to you. We can get about 170, 180 gigabytes a second of DDR bandwidth for a uh, for a node Re reading writing data uh, to a node, and we can get about four, you know somewhere between 30 and 50 gigabytes a second bandwidth reading and writing to the non-volatile memory to this opt-in memory for a single node. If you compare that to our Lustre file system on our big array, 
and there we have um, 20 gigabytes for the whole file system is the best you can ever get. So we can see that, you know, compared to traditional I.O. technologies, this can be really, you know, very, very uh, high performance, but it is slower than memory. Um, there are also, as I've, I've previously mentioned, multiple ways of using this memory. OK, so it, it plugs into the motherboard as normal memory. You can just access it in this thing called uh, what I call one LM, one level memory mode, or, or Intel called app direct mode. And there it, you just use it from your application as a separate memory space. So if you think you're a C, uh, C++ sort of programmer, if you think malloc or, or new, something like that, you can just malloc some memory into this uh, in non-volatile memory. And just then once you've created it, you just use it in your application like you would normally. OK, uh, now a normal malloc won't access this memory. But there are new malloc's um, pmem uh, map file uh, function, which we'll see later, uh, which let you access this. And so that's all you need to do to get to get to allocate data on that, so open up uh, data on that and, and, and exploit it. But of course, not all, not everybody is going to want to necessarily change their application, but they still may want to use this very large memory space. So Intel provide a other way of using it called memory mode, or what I call two level memory, two LM. And here, um, you're not using this non-volatile memory as a persistent store. You're using it as if it was volatile memory and, and all your data is automatically mapped into it. Because what happens is your DRAM, your normal memory becomes a last level cache. And then the, the non-volatile memory becomes the data store that sits behind it. So whether uh, you create data or you, uh, you, you, know, you read or write data, you read and write to DRAM, and then that gets pushed back into a non-volatile memory by the memory controller automatically for you when you, when you run out of DRAM. So it, it acts as a transparent cache to you. And so you know, this memory mode is there for people to easily use this very large memory space without having to change your applications. Um, and you know, it potentially, because the DRAM is being used as a cache, as long as your memory access patterns are sensible, you might get performance which is very close to DRAM whilst using this very large um, memory space. Now, of course, the performance degrades the more the larger your resident data set. So the more you're moving data in and out of that DRAM cache into the into their non-volatile memory and back, uh, the slower you're going to get. Uh, you know, so you may your application may be a bit slower, or it may be twice as slow as if you're just using DRAM, but it gives you access to a much larger memory space. And so, not you know, uh, last week I was working with people who want to do some MATLAB calculations on a terabyte of data, and they don't have any systems with a terabyte of of DRAM in it. So we we um, put it onto this system here. It's only got 192 gigabytes of DRAM, but because we can use it in this 2LM mode, we, we don't have to change MATLAB at all. We just run the, the, the code on there. Um, and it, and it's, it's, it's slower than if you were running it on pure DRAM system, but it's uh, still much faster than if you had to swap data in that disk, or um, it lets you run this without, without, um, without shutting you know, without buying very large amounts of, of volatile memory. Um, so I have uh, predictably um, uh, spoke for longer than I planned to. And so that's three o'clock there. We're not quite through this presentation, but I think actually it's, it's probably a sensible time to take a break now. Uh, I'll come back and finish this presentation off in half an hour. And in the meantime, what I'll do is I'll distribute to you over email um, the details of the practical stuff we can do, and you can you can log on to the system and play around with it now if you want, or you can wait till till the end of the lecture today and then have a look between between now and next week. Um, okay, uh, welcome back. I'm hoping you've all had an email from you me by now. It's time to take a little bit of time to go out, so um, do let me know if you've not received your email. Uh, and I'll sort that out. Um, 
but uh, you should have an email telling you your guest account name uh, and uh, giving you the location of the exercise sheet which tells you how to log on to the system and uh, tells you what exercises you can do on the system. Uh, I mean, for now, we're just looking at the the first um, exercise. Well, not for now, but um, once we, once I finish speaking, the um, the uh, idea will be just to look at the first uh, exercise or the first two exercises. Um, so on the exercise sheet, uh, let me see if I can share that so it's obvious. Allow. So the exercise sheet looks like this. The first bit here tells you how we access the system. Now we have a slight complication with the system where we have to log in through a, a, a sort of gateway node called Hydra VPN, and then we when we log directly into the system from there. Um, and it tells you how to. It's all run through a batch system. We run through Slurm, so it tells you how to do this here. Um, sometimes we set up a reservation for this, but we haven't. We haven't because the system's quite quiet at the moment. Um, but the idea is just to do this exercise here, running a basic program. Um, and then once I finish this lecture, exercise for Numera, where IO, um, and and, uh, uh, and we can call it a day there. But uh, I'll send more details around <coughs> after I finish this, um, this, this couple of lectures. Uh, we can uh, discuss those. So let me go back to share my presentation because I hadn't quite unfortunately finish talking about the hardware and um, we'll get through this and then we'll talk uh, about some of the programming uh, functionality uh, as well so let me just get to a point where I can move my slides on we can discuss them too many windows open so yes as I was saying before before the break you can actually use this mode in, in two different ways uh, with WinLM app direct mode which is where we program the memory directly. We have to change our applications to use it, or we have to put our files onto the onto the persistent memory uh, and, and and use it that way. Or this 2LM mode, which is a memory mode, where all we're doing is using this non-volatile functionality for a very large memory space. We're not exploiting the fact that it's um, non-volatile. We're not actually able to leave our data there long term because it has this DRAM sitting in front of it as a cache. So of course, if you lost power, any data that hadn't been flushed out of a DRAM into the non-volatile memory uh, persistent region would be lost. So effectively that second mode, that memory mode is not about persistent memory at all. It's just about very large memory spaces. But the nice thing about it is it does mean you can use this hardware without having to reprogram your, your applications at all. You can just, uh, turn on a particular mode and it gives you access to a much bigger memory space although the performance may vary depending on exactly what your application is doing. Uh, this is not something you can do uh, you know per application this is um, something that uh, requires uh, BIOS configurations or, or, or reboots so so you either have your computer your node set up in this memory mode this 2LM mode or you have it set up in this app direct mode where you can uh, talk to it directly so most of the functionality we're talking about today and next week is we're con we are focusing on app direct one lm mode where you can program the hardware yourself and you can choose what data you put on it and you can choose when to put the data on it and you choose how when to make you know persist it and make sure the data is there um, <clears throat> fundamentally when we set that up, the, the interesting thing about the the way that Intel and others have have gone about setting up the, the programming functionality for this persistent memory is actually um, you still create a file system on top of that persistent memory, or you can still create a file system on top of that persistent memory, even though it's memory sitting in memory channels and dims behind the memory controller, you can still map a file system to it so that means you can just use this as a very fast file system if you want now <clears throat> if you do that you you get you lose some of the benefits particularly you uh you lose this top benefit that i've put here called cache coherent coherent data accesses because the memory is plugged into the memory controller of the processor um, it, you can access data in the same way you access it in DRAM. That is, 
you can access effectively individual bytes of data in the memory uh, just by addressing them. Just by saying A equals B plus C, you can get B and C from memory and store it to A. And it doesn't matter if that's in DRAM or if it's in uh, this persistent memory, it, it does the, the same thing, albeit with different performance. Of course, in reality, the way our processes work, you never access individual bytes of memory. You know, we have a cache hierarchy in our processes uh, and data is stored or loaded using cache lines. So you might be la loading 128 bytes or 256 bytes uh, cache lines, and then you can get the data out, uh, uh, from those um, individual bytes of data from those into uh, registers and, and worked on by the processor. But it's at this cache level, cache line level, that actual memory operations happen in modern processors. And the same is true for this persistent memory. So when we were talking before that file systems on on what we call block devices, so traditional disk drives or SSDs, uh, be them attached over uh, IDE or, or um, NVMe or uh, SATA interfaces, are, are block devices where you move sort of 4K, 4096 bytes uh, or, or 16K or something like that uh, every time you want to do it. When we're playing with the opt-in uh, persistent memory, we can work on, on cache lines and, and effectively we can work on individual bytes because of the way the, the cache system and, uh, and the memory system works. And that means that we have a really quite a nice um, functionality that this persistent memory gives us that we can do you know, individual byte access to files, to, to, well, to files or to data not to files, but to data you store in there with uh, high performance. Okay, so we can access the individual bytes of data rather than having to load, rely on the operating system loading up one large block of the data at a time. And so if we have these access patterns where we don't want to do contiguous access to data, then the persistent memory stuff, persistent memory hardware lets us get much higher performance in those scenarios than you would from a file system. So why have I gone through that whole explanation? But if we set up a file system on this persistent memory, which we, we can do, then um, we lose the benefits of that uh, byte addressability or that cache line addressability functionality, which this hardware gives us. Because if we've got a file system on there, then we're going to manage that data through the operating system and we're going to revert back to loading up 4K blocks every time. So you can set up uh, these non-volatile memory as a file system. In fact, you do set it up as a file system. But if you just access it, the data on there through files, you know, traditional F open, write, you know, F write, F read, those kind of things, um, you lose some of the benefits we get from this persistent memory, uh, this uh, the, the ability to um, access individual bytes of data or individual cache lines of data. Now, for some applications, this might not matter because you may be doing contiguous data accesses all the time. And then in that scenario, the performance difference is not great. Uh, but if you're reading and writing small chunks of data and moving around in the file, you definitely don't want to uh, just rely on the file interfaces because that will um, not necessarily well that will not give you the best performance and as we were talking about before uh, if you have to do file stuff then you are mapping your data structure to your program into this flat file and then you have to map them back out again when you read them again whereas the nice thing about treating this uh, hardware as memory is i can set up a 3d array in this non-volatile memory and then just save it because it's persistent and then when I open my program up back next time, I can I already have that 3D array all set up. I don't have to do any serialization, deserialization, data structure constructing, data structure um, deconstructing, any of those kind of things, because I can treat the data as if it was, you know, I can use the data, I can create the data once, create the data structures once, and then just save them and load them further down the line. Uh, if you read any of the uh, online material or any of the manuals 
or, or the descriptions of a persistent memory, you will find people talking about things like FSDAX and DevDAX. Uh, and that's because there are multiple different options for configuring the, the file systems you set up on these. Um, in reality, most of the time, it doesn't actually um, matter for performance or functionality uh, which one of these you use. Um, there are slight differences between FSDAX and DevDAX, um, whichever file systems you may set up on the uh, DIMMs to, 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 to support some of the work you're doing. Uh, and the real one is that the, the DevDAX may be faster um, if you're creating lots of small files, if you're doing lots of file operations, opening, closing files, or if you're creating lots of memory space operations, opening and closing memory spaces a lot. Uh, then DevDAX may be faster than FSDAX. <clears throat> once the, once you've created a memory space, then there's functionally no difference between FSDAX and DevDAX. Now, don't worry if what I'm talking about here makes no sense. I mean, it, it, I'm introducing things here a little bit early, uh, but uh, uh, quite technical details about how the hardware is set up. So you don't really need to worry about this at all. It's just that quite often people have already seen some discussion of these terms or, or, or have some feeling for you know uh, these kind of um, setups uh, so it, 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 if you have questions about those do let me know but w you may see things like FSDAX mentioned uh, later and DevDAX they're just ways of creating a um, like a file system memory space on this non-volatile memory which you can use from your application um, as I said do, 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 do just uh, shout at me or, or, or drop in a question if you do have any questions because you know some of this stuff gets quite complicated uh, it's, it's likely I won't explain it very coherently so uh, if any of it doesn't make any sense then do just let me know uh, either through the chats here or, or just speak or um, send me an email uh, and we can uh, I can try and explain it uh, more coherently um, just as a slight aside um, that memory mode functionality, which I talked about earlier, where you don't, where you use memory as a, the DRAM as a cache, uh, and the chain memory as a big data area, which I said is you know it's a great way of using this if you don't want to reprogram your code and you don't care about the persistence, but you just want access to a very big memory space. Um, it, it, but I said it doesn't necessarily give you as good a performance as a large DRAM would. And part of that is because um, because you're adding this extra level of memory in it, and your DRAM now effectively becomes a cache. Uh, every time you look up data when you uh, do a store or, or a load, um, there is this uh, sort of, you know, in fact, every time you, you need to load new data in from the non-volatile memory to a processor, you have a bit of an extra penalty because you first have to go and check is it in DRAM first. And then if it's not in DRAM, you have to go out to a non-volatile memory. I mean, this is all handled for you by the, the processor and its memory control. You physically don't have to do anything, but the hardware is doing this. Um, and that just means that it, it, this this memory mode stuff is, is quite a nice way of doing things, but it does have a performance penalty. And so traditionally, not traditionally, um, Anecdotally, we see it about being 10, you know, if you're using the memory uh, efficiently, reasonably efficiently, it's still about 10% slower than if you weren't doing this. So if you're just using DRAM by itself and nothing else. Uh, and so 10% is not terrible, you know, if it gives you access to a much larger memory space. So on these nodes, potentially we could have up to three terabytes of memory. Um, and you can, you know, if it's going 10 or 15% slower, but, but you get to run your full data set in a single node, that may be still very beneficial to you, but it's just worth bearing in mind. Um, the other interesting thing that this whole configuration of putting mem non-volatile memory in the memory channels uh, of processes is um, that it gives you non-uniform memory access issues as well. So just like any system where we have two processes or more, any multi-socket system, um, there is a different uh, cost in terms of uh, time and bandwidth to access memory attached to a processor on the other socket than there is attaching memory on, on your own socket. 
Uh, so this is non-uniform numerous stuff, non-uniform memory access stuff. So just like we have with normal memory and, and numer issues, we have um, we have the same thing for uh, non-volatile memory. So on the system we're going to be using, you should have accounts for now. Uh, there are two processors per node. Each processor has one and a half terabytes of this memory plugged into it. Uh, if you were just to take you know, the first core on the first processor and then access all the non-volatile memory, all the three terabytes across the whole node, you're perfectly able to do that, but it's much slower. It's about two times slower to read the data from the remote uh, process, you know, from the processor your core is not on and then it is from the local one, and about four times slower writing it. So we've, you know, we, we have exactly the same numerous issues we have with volatile memory, um, but just you have to be aware of them for non-volatile memory. Volatile memory, and then trying to read it from all the cores in the chip, some will, will run slower than the others. Um, of course, there's nice bits of, not nice, there's bits of codes um, which you can use uh, to look up which process you're on and then you know choose the correct memory to write data to and read data from and this top one here is intel specific but here get processor and core is one you can use in the practicals which is you run this bit of code and it tells you from this core what what um which socket it am i on and then you can use that to decide which bit of uh, memory to read and write your data from and it does make a difference um so this here is is now here we're just looking at benchmarking file I.O. but using the non-volatile memory. Um, and here we've got a single node. We've, we've set up a file system on both sockets. So we've got two separate file systems, one for all the non-volatile memory attached to the first processor and one for all the non-volatile memory attached to the second processor. And if I use it efficiently, I can get a read bandwidth of, of uh, well, if this is going across all 34 nodes in the system, um, I can get a read bandwidth of, uh, of up to, you know, 1.8 terabytes a second and a write bandwidth of about 300 gigabytes um, a second. Uh, that uh, is very, very dependent on on this NUMA effect. So here, if I look at um, the nodes um, and I I uh, either do a sensible NUMA thing, which is to graph on the right hand side. So I make sure each processor is right into its local memory. Uh, then I can see that the blue bars are about twice as high if you, if you take into account the y-axis scale difference to on the left hand side where I'm only using all the memory on socket one. Uh, and so I, I, some of the processes are getting a slower memory access sign. And so we can see there that the read bandwidth is uh, over 800 gigabytes a second for 16 nodes on the right hand side uh, and 400 gigabytes a second for 16 nodes on the left hand side. Uh, so it's about half. If I don't make sure my data is in the correct place, so don't make sure my files are in the correct place, I can, I can you know, get about half the performance um, that I should be able to get. Uh, and actually, to the right, it's even worse. So on the on the in my graph on the right hand side, I've got over 100 gigabytes a second uh, right on 16 nodes, um, about 150 gigabytes a second, and then on the left hand side, I've got uh, about 30 gigabytes a second or something like that. So you can see that there are performance impacts um, we 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 have uh, there. There are also um, some slight complexities in the performance. You can. Um, actually, if I flick back to the hardware picture, it may make more sense. Um, but there's a little bit of a subtlety down here in that um, the actual physical hardware itself on the left hand side, that stack of yellow and green bars, it's set up to work on 256 uh, bit, uh, uh, 256 uh, Bit transfers and uh, that means it moves data the the onboard controller on the dims in 256 bit chunks i.e four double precision numbers um, and so if you are for instance uh, not 
using the contiguous memory if you are accessing a bit of data and then jumping and accessing another bit of data you may not quite get the full performance because of these um, internal 256 bit transfers inside the processor so that means that um, we have this we, we may have some variability in a little bit of variability in performance because of the onboard controller is doing things like coalescing accesses into 256 byte blocks um, and it has uh, read and write cues inside it. So if, if you fill some of those up, it may go slightly slower. But in general, um, particularly for the, the sort of uh, sensible file access patterns, you see very uh, consistent performance on this on this hardware um, for benchmarking that we've done. Um, there are uh, also a whole bunch of hardware things you can configure on it, which we you probably don't care about, but there is potential to set power caps for power limits for the dims so you can have the dims look running in low power medium power or high power mode and that can affect performance all the stuff we're in at the moment is in high power mode but 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 there are there is potential there to play around with that kind of stuff um yeah so we, we can ignore the, the slides on virtual memory and and uh, and volatile memory that's okay so the hardware is, is relatively complicated and it has many different ways you can use it, but there is potential there for very high performance, both, you know, very high read performance very and, you know, comparatively, you know, very good write performance, particularly compared to tra traditional I.O. things. Uh, but one of the really nice features is this byte addressability, which means that you can uh, take IO access patterns, which have been very uh, poor performance in the past, map them onto its hardware and, 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 and potentially get very good performance. So you may, for instance, be able to work with much smaller chunks of data than you have done in the past. So instead of um, opening up a file and reading the entirety into DRAM, um, you may be able to open up a file and read a small chunk into DRAM, work on that and then store that back out and open up a file and, uh, and read another chunk. And indeed, then beyond that, moving away from file I.O. And, and the overheads of uh, doing file opens and file closes through the, op closes through the operating system um, can also give you performance benefits because you don't have those kind of large chunk, uh, data chunk costs with block costs and you don't have the operating system overheads. Um, so if you can access it directly with memory, and then finally, the fact that it lets you configure your memory, your data structures in a way that's useful for your application and then persist those to store them as they were set up means that you can create a, you know, a whole set of storage, which is not just a flat file, but is a sensible configured storage space for your application so that when you load it up next time, it's just ready to go. It's not uh, something where you have to go through and process and move things around and, and, and set stuff up. Uh, but that, of course, means that to get the best performance of, out of this hardware, you're going to need to change applications and you're going to change applications in a sensible way um, really program them to, to access that memory uh, and then give you the performance you want. The other way of using this hardware we've also discussed is this sort of uh, cache mode, this uh, memory mode, uh, 2LM memory, where you don't have to change your application at all, but you won't get the full performance of the hardware, and you don't get this benefit of the data being non-volatile, because because of that big DRAM cache, you, you have a point where you can't uh, persist over uh, power failures over those kind of things. Uh, any questions? Uh, if not, what I will do is um, I will introduce you to the, um, let me have a look, introduce you to the programming um, APIs for this memory, uh, which is not um, uh, a particularly long lecture, and then uh, draw the lectures to a close and then that'll give you a scope to go off and play with the system and look at some of the programming APIs uh, afterwards between now and, and uh, next week.
Um, so yeah, as, but as I say, if you do have any, oh, in fact, I, I haven't quite finished this lecture, have I? So there's a couple of things that people are also interested in. One is cost, um, and the answer is that at the moment this Intel Optane stuff is probably quite expensive. Uh, these are old, old figures now, so you can see here that uh, when I looked online probably a year ago now, you're looking at about £8,000 a DIMM for very big ones. Um, uh, more recent sort of numbers are, um, are not that um, dissimilar. Uh, but so, it, so you know, a couple of uh, thousand pounds per dim, maybe. Uh, it depends on how much you're buying. Uh, but the the selling point from Intel's perspective, at least, is that it always should be cheaper per gigabyte to buy this memory than it would be to buy a normal DRAM. But of course, because it's such a large memory, it can be quite expensive. Um, so you know, they're sort of targeting the uh, buying dim sizes of, of uh, uh, you know, 20, 30 euros a, uh, a gigabyte is what they they think sensible. But now these are uh, numbers are subject to change. Are probably not correct anymore. Uh, and the ones you know they they, they are um, just to give you a ballpark. But, but we don't expect the memory at this point in time to be particularly cheap. But it's meant to be cheaper than DRAM on a per gigabyte day basis. Uh, just it's very large. So putting a large amount in a, in a single server may be quite expensive at the moment. The good thing is uh, we have a system with 34 nodes in it. Each has got three terabytes. So if it's something you're wanting to play around with or something that would be useful to you, uh, it's a system we're quite happy to give people access to or quite happy to uh, you know, ne negotiate access to for, for companies as well. So um, you don't have to go out and buy this for yourselves, uh, certainly uh, not at the moment. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, hopefully as well, you've all got the exercise sheet now uh, where, where uh, if you want to go and have a play, you can go and have a look at a couple of the exercises. For now, I'm just going to go on to the uh, low level persistent memory programming th framework. Um, and then we'll leave uh, thinking about you know, persistent thinking uh, till, till next week and we'll, and we'll pick that back up uh, next week. Uh, and as always, any questions, just shout at me. So let me just set this up for presenting. OK, so the, the nice thing is there's really, uh, you know, um, a, a, simp a pretty simple way to program this memory, uh, just like you have a reasonably simple way to program normal files. So here's a bit of um, Fortran. Uh, where I'm just doing standard I.O. stuff. I do a file open, I can read, I can write, I can close my file. I can do a file open, I can read in a loop with some formatting, I can and then close my file. Uh, of course, as, as, as previously mentioned, there are some overheads associated with file I.O., which, which would be nice to, be, to avoid. Um, so uh, we'll spiff over parallel file. But, but there's been... Um, for a while, for quite a long time in, in Linux and Unix, there's been a way to get around some of these file I/O overheads by doing what's called a memory mapped file. So this is actually saying, okay, what you're working on is is something that's in a file, but what I will do is I will map that file into into normal volatile memory for you, and then let you do all your work on it in volatile memory, and then at some point we'll copy it back into a file system once you've done your update. And so this standard memory mapped file functionality has been around for a while, and it gets over around some of these overheads of these file open, file close, block, block uh, data movements. Uh, and it looks a bit like this. I open a standard file, and then I M map it to give me a pointer. And then once I have that pointer, I can close the file, and I can do my work on the data in main memory. And the uh, operating system virtual memory management page table stuff will move uh, data in and out as required. Um, of course, I may have to be a little bit careful to make sure any updates I do get back to a file properly, uh, but that, that's the functionality that's in there. And once you've memory mapped a file, then 
all your accesses and your operations work on that uh, memory level. So things are uh, done at a, a load store cache line level, just like we're going to get with uh, not this non-volatile memory. Um, to make sure your updates get back to a file out of the main memory, then um, there has to be some kind of sort of flushing um, when dirty when you've changed the data at some point it has to get flushed back to main memory uh, into to disk sorry from main memory and the operating system takes care of that for you but you don't know when it does it so it, it does it when when page uh, pages are uh, evicted from a page cache um, and then you know anything that's been changed will be written back to the operating to, to the file system uh, but you have no control over that so if the program you know if a computer lost power or crashed your file would be in an inconsistent state so it's not really um necessarily designed uh, particularly for making sure that files are um uh, pretty, uh consistent well uh up updated properly um or updated safely without without you putting in some uh level of uh, new functionality like m syncs to to make sure your data is flush back um, but it is a way of getting around some of these um, file system uh, overheads um, and what the people who have developed the programming interfaces for this new non volatile then we have done is just follow exactly the same uh, process so they have taken over the idea of memory mapping a file uh, but now, instead of memory mapping into volatile memory, you're going to be memory mapping that to non-volatile. Um, and it does very similar things to a normal memory map. Of course, it doesn't read the data into volatile memory. It doesn't read the data into DRAM because your data is already persistent on the non-volatile memory. But it just loads. It tells the the um, processor and the memory controller here's some data. Here, this is where it's located. Uh, this is the data uh, your program can work on. Um, and then persistence uh, is then taken care of for you by the uh, um, memory controller. Uh, when data is evicted from a cache, it will get flushed back to uh, this non volatile memory. Uh, and this was developed through. Uh, the, some SNEER working groups, so the Storage and Network uh, Interface Association working groups, um, and first came onto the scene as something called PMEM, PMEM.io, uh, has now evolved into something called PMDK, Persistent Memory Development Kit. And there's a website out there uh, with all the information on it, and also a GitHub page with the actual. Uh, uh, library source code on it uh, uh, listed on this slide as well. Uh, the PMDK actually has um, quite a lot of different functionality in it. Um, so from some very low level libraries to some higher level stuff, uh, but it's all wrapped up together in, in, uh, in the same uh, 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 library. So what uh, the PMDK has uh, well, one part is called libmemkind, um, and this is uh, the sort of a software approach to doing that 2LM memory mode functionality, uh, where if you don't care about persistence, um, you can use libmemkind to give you an allocator, which will let you allocate memory on uh, persistent memory on this non-volatile memory. Uh, the file is tra transparent. Uh, and will be removed when your application uh, terminates. So libmemkind lets you treat the uh, non-volatile memory as a just a sort of a big or big area of data, um, and you can uh, read and write it as you require. But it's not designed there to give you this persistent memory functionality. It's pretty easy to do. You just import the memkind header. Uh, unfortunately, most of this is, in, is, is, well, this is all C, C++ at the moment. There are interfaces to other languages, but the primary developments in, in, in C. Um, you, uh, there's a function called mekind create pmem, 
Uh, and for that, you give it a file system path. So here you can see it's slash mount slash FS DAX zero. So effectively that's saying, give me the hard, the memory which is associated with the first socket, with the first processor, and create me an array, uh, an array uh, or a, a chunk of data specified by array size and give me back a pointer called my data. And once we've got my data, we can then create arrays off it. So here I'm doing a memkind malloc, uh, and that will create me an array of a thousand elements. And I can create multiple arrays in here of, of different shapes and sizes or multiple variables in here. And they'll all exist on the non-volatile memory. They won't be uh, using your DRAM at all. Um, and that can be a pretty straightforward way of using this. Um, there is a new version coming out, uh, which will also address um, NUMA awareness uh, in the sense that on this uh, example here, I'm specifying exactly which file system and, uh, and, uh, I want to create that data structure on this mount FSDAX zero. Uh, and that is tied to a particular socket, socket zero or socket one on, on these systems. So from different processes, you'd want to choose a different mount point there. I'd either want to do mount FSDAX zero or mount uh, MNT FSDAX one. Uh, and that would be, you know, if I'm running on core zero, I'd choose mount zero. And if I'm running on core uh, 25, I would choose mount one. There is a new uh, version of this library coming out, uh, which will automatically do that stuff for you as well. So you don't do the uh, memkind create pmem, you just do a memkind malloc and you say uh, memkind malloc, my data size and float memkind underscore dax underscore k mem and that will say okay create it in the volatile non-volatile memory which is closest to this call that called the function um, so that that would be i think it might already actually be uh, out as well um because a couple of uh, a couple of months ago i wrote these slides the um the but, but in, in general i don't we're not doing stuff with the volatile memory functionality because if you want that kind of functionality, you can generally get it through the 2LM mode, the memory mode load, uh, memory mode uh, setup. And so that requires no application changes, whereas using libmemkind, you know, you have to do some changes to your code. So, uh, for, uh, and generally not with a massive performance difference. So we tend to, to not uh, favor that at the moment. Uh, the one, the functionality that gives you a persistent memory approach where you can control where you allocate data and you can control when it's written back to the non-volatile memory to make sure that it is there safely um, is this library called pmem um, and so it's sort of the lowest level of approach for this functionality um, and it provides you a memory map function to map data from non-volatile memory into the address space of your program and then it gives you uh, some optimized functions to move copy uh, those kind of things data around and it gives you the functions to say now make sure this data has been persisted back to the hardware so it's safe now you know now make sure this data is no longer in the cache but it's actually made it all the way back to the hardware so if i lose power now um, that data will be there and be protected um, and so it, it looks like this. This is, in fact, you know, just a slightly uh, more uh, elaborate version of the first example I showed you right at the beginning. With a, uh, it's another streams example, uh, but it, you can see now we've got this pmem underscore map underscore file function, and that is just a memory map function designed to work on this persistent memory. And so I give it a path, so that's going to tell it you know, uh, what file system will you use? Um, and really that effectively that's just telling it, you know, which bit of hardware are you going to be using? So it creates a file to, to put all your data in, but it's not really using the file as a file. It's just a, a place that the operating system can say, okay, you're using that bit of persistent memory. I can understand that in my page tables and my memory management stuff. And then I pass in some parameters. How, how big a, 
um, an address space I want, um, and uh, a couple of things that you know tell me how big a space you created and tell me is this actually this memory or, or, or are you faking it? And then once I have that pmem address, pmem address uh, thing pointer on the left hand side, I can then just use that to create all the storage I want. So here I'm creating three arrays, each of the same size, um, or from that um, initial pointer. And then down here, I'm just I'm running those as if they were normal arrays created from malloc or created statically. A equals B plus scalar times C. So we've got a triad. Um, and all A, B, and C there are located on the non-volatile memory. So I'm not using my DRAM for any of those at all. And so the, the whole um, calculation will be using non-volatile memory. And then crucially, I have this call at the end here, pmem persist. And that effectively says, OK, uh, at this point, take all the data which is still in the cache or on the process of registers and make sure that that has been copied back directly into the non-volatile memory so that once pmem persist has finished, I am safe in the knowledge that my data has stored, been stored on the non-volatile memory. So if I lose power, it will still be there when I switch back on. And then you can unmap and, and you can you know delete the file or whatever. Uh, deleting the file will get rid of your data, but you can then unmap and, and your data is there. Um, so here you can see the programmer is responsible for setting up the persistent memory, so uh, that PMM map file. Um, once we have that, they can just use the memory spaces as normal in a program, but they're also responsible for deciding when and where to enforce copying the data back to the uh, non-volatile memory and making sure that ultimately it is there. And, and so for applications where you care um, about whether uh, what the state of data is in, if you lose power or if something goes wrong, then you've got to be careful to do that in the right place. Because here in this application, um, if I lost power you know, halfway through the loop, then um, A may have been updated some of A may have been updated, none of A may have been updated. It all depends on what had been evicted from the CPU cache, um, and you know what, what what had made it back from the CPU cache into a non-volatile memory uh, through the non-volatile memory controller and and actually onto the hardware itself. And you know you don't know beforehand where and when and where that's going to happen unless you call this function pmem persist, and then you know after that. Uh, function is finished, you know that data you specify here has actually gone back in uh, to, the, to the hardware. Um, so, and, and I can put that pmem persist wherever I want. So I could put it inside the loop, um, uh, and instead of persisting the whole array, I could just persist each element individually by changing the second argument of pmem persist and saying, you know, don't persist the uh, array size, just persist the the size of a single element. Um, but uh, of course, each one of those persist operations takes some time because you have to flush data out of the cache and then you have to wait for that data to reach the hardware. And we know that writing this data, you know, takes about seven times longer than writing it to DRAM. So we've got a bit, bit of um, a delay there, particularly as the processor is, is working much faster than DRAM anyway. Um, we all know we should all know that you need to be working on data in your cache to get good performance, not data in the DRAM. So if I'm flushing out data every iteration of that loop to the non-volatile memory, then it's unlikely it's likely my performance is going to be quite low. Uh, whereas if I can say actually I can do the whole operation, uh, I don't mind if I have corruption of that A array. Um, whilst it's going on, but once it's finished, I want to make sure it's there. Then I can put the PMEM persist at the end um, and get a better performance, uh, but with a caveat that if I had a failure halfway through the loop, my that, a, that original A array may be corrupted now, may not have a, the right values in it. Um, just in a bit more detail, um, PMEM map file um, 
uh, as we've already seen, looks like this, where the first argument you pass is the location of the PMEM memory. And so on the system that we're going to play with, it's either slash MNT slash PMEM FS DAX 0 or slash MNT slash PMEM FS DAX 1. Uh, and that's because we've set it up with this FS DAX file system. If you'd have created a dev DAX file system, which I mentioned before, then it would look more like slash dev slash DAX 12. Uh, as I say, you probably don't care about the difference between those, but there is some slight, there are some performance differences between when you, if you're doing a lot of PMEM map file calls, then you'd want to do the dev DAX version rather than the uh, FS DAX version. But for if you just do one PMEM map file call, for instance, create a larger address space and then manage that yourself inside your program, then you then you don't care about which one of these you're doing. Uh, and then the persist function is pretty straightforward. It just takes the address you want to persist and the number of bytes you want to persist. Um, and then uh, it will write the data back to the hardware. Okay. Now, the hit, when you call this, the data may already be in hardware. It may already have been evicted from a cache and got there. And this will then check, OK, it is, and it will return. But you don't know until you've got this that you did, whether your data is on the hardware or not. Um, uh, and yes, you could specify here you want to write individual bytes of data back, or you know, a 64-bit double or something like that. Uh, but just be aware that you know, all the memory operations in your processor are going to work on cache lines anyway. Um, so even if you said, you know, write one byte back, it's likely to be writing, you know, 64 bytes or, or 256 bytes uh, or something like that back rather than your your uh, one byte. Uh, in reality, PMEM persist is, is doing two things, actually. It, what it actually does under the hood is it flushes the processor cache. So it takes stuff out of the cache and makes sure they've been flushed out by the memory controller to the non-volatile hardware. And then it does a, what's called a PMEM drain, which is effectively going to a non-volatile hardware and saying, have you taken that and actually uh, processed it, taken it out of your your buffers in on, on the non-volatile DIMMs and put it into the, the hardware, the, the actual phase change hardware itself. Um, there, there is another function. There are some other functions in here. P, PMEM is PMEM is, uh, is there because you can run this uh, PMDK library without uh, non-volatile memory in a system um, and, and does it do all the design and, and um, development stuff without the hardware there and it, and it lets you put in some functionality to see actually are we on persistent memory or, or are we faking it at this point. Um, so that can be useful because we can, um, if you are actually just using a file system behind it and not persistent memory, then the PMEM persist function will, will, will sort of uh, do some other calls to to make sure your memory map files are correct. Uh, and more usefully, um, there's a there's a bunch of optimized memory set, memory copy, memory move functions in the library as well, uh, which can give you better performance for bulk memory operations uh, and can also give you so this will be pmem move copy and set functions but also persist move persist copy and persist set which will move to and make sure it's um, flushed out to the the hardware for you you don't have to move it and then flush it and move it and then flush it and and really that's it so the, there is a, a few other bits and pieces in the lowest level pmem library but it's PMDK library is PMEM, but, but really all you need is PMEM map file, PMEM persist, um, probably PMEM unmap as well to, to close things down at the end. But those three functions will give you uh, what you need to set up the memory spaces uh, and uh, read and write data from those memory spaces. And of course, then the challenge is that it's up to you to decide where you put the persists, what data you put in there, what data you leave in DRAM instead, uh, and, and getting that balance right to give you your uh, sensible performance is, uh, is, is the key challenge for, for both the sensible performance and the correctness. 
is the key challenge for this persistent memory stuff. Um, so with that, the idea uh, now is that I, I won't do any more lecturing today. We just uh, you can just get on the system and have a play around with it. Um, as I said previously, there is um, uh, there are a couple of different um, app, uh, exercises we can do. Uh, let me bring up the F again. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. I should really not have so many tabs open because it makes it hard to um, to find the one I want. They're nearly there. Exercise sheet. No, not that one. Uh, there's a couple of exercises to do. Uh, at this point, the first two or three, so exercise, um, I'll just do this. Uh, exercise two is just copying some programs, so streams benchmark and IOR benchmark. So streams is a memory benchmark, IOR is a file system benchmark. Just copy them, unpack them, um, uh, go, into a, go into a directory, make them and, and run them. Uh, uh, just to make sure you can get up and running, you can submit jobs to a batch system uh, and you can get results. They should just be able to tell you <clears throat> that uh, the sort of raw performance of our Lustre file system on this cluster, which is not very good, uh, and the raw performance of the, uh, of the hardware using this uh, um, uh, non-volatile memory and the DRAM. Um, and but then uh, beyond that, have a look at see if we can take IOR and alter it so that we we'll write into the correct mount point so we are numer aware IOR um, and also uh, create a user libmem kind stuff uh, to play around with uh, uh, non volatile memory or the volatile memory. And then have a look at the streams practical and see if you can, instead of writing to DRAM, you can write to um, the non-volatile memory by changing the source code for streams so that you use a PMEM map file, get your pointers back, and then do all your, your writing in there. And you can you then play around with, you know, do I put all my arrays onto the volatile memory? Do I put some of them onto the non-volatile memory and see what the, the different uh, hardware um, uh, points are so let me go back to my uh, there we go uh, back to here so uh, with that I will say uh, there's nothing more I wanted to say this afternoon uh, but if you have any questions um, or any uh, issues doing the practicals or getting online then do feel free to get in touch with me. Uh, the, hopefully the idea is the practical sheet should be detailed enough that you can log on to a system and work out what to do. But um, generally, um, they are a bit sparse. So if at any point you're like, I don't really know what I'm meant to be doing here, then do just drop me an email. My email address is on the, on the screen at the moment. And you should have an email from me telling you the, the details of, of the system to log on, those kind of things. So just have a, have a go. Um, see how you get on. Let me know if you have any problems or questions. Um, and if not, we will reconvene uh, um, two o'clock next week uh, to, to finish off the lectures and, and see how you got on with the practicals.